journey of an entrepreneur is one that cannot be taught. It is as unique to a person as their DNA. The world of business is ever-changing. Only a few manage to crawl out of the trenches of failure to the apex of success. My name is Peace Hyde, and this is My Worst Day on Forbes Africa TV. Today on My Worst Day, we are sitting down with a man who managed to turn 200 Naira into a multi-million dollar conglomerate. Before we meet this business magnate, let's take a look at his journey so far. Born in the Anambra state, which is located in the eastern part of Nigeria, Dr. Cosmas Madruka is one of Nigeria's most enterprising and industrious business leaders. Dr. Cosmas Maduka serves as the president and chairman of the Coscharis Group, a leading automotive spare parts dealer and franchise owners of about eight car brands, which includes luxury brands such as Rolls-Royce, Range Rover, BMW and Jaguar. From humble beginnings, Dr. Maduka has managed to grow his business empire with a seed capital of only 200 Naira. Today, the group has over 26 branches nationwide, with a heavy presence in three African countries, namely Ghana, Gabon and Côte d'Ivoire. The group's business portfolio features supply, installation, maintenance and repairs of medical and laboratory equipments, pharmaceuticals, sales and services of automobiles. The company is diversified into auto sales and auto services, with state-of-the-art showrooms and workshops across Nigeria, as well as interest in food, beverages, petrochemicals and agriculture. Koscharis Group recently signed a deal with Ford Motor Company for the assembly of its new Ford pickup trucks in Nigeria. My name is Peace Hyde and you're watching Forbes Africa TV and joining us on My Worst Day is Dr. Cosmas Maduka. You're most, most welcome to My Worst Day. Thank you, Peace. Um, now, Dr. Cosmas Maduka, you have had such a colourful um, journey to becoming such a successful entrepreneur and it's only right for us to ask the question, who is Cosmos Maduka? Um, Cosmos Maduka is the chairman President CEO of Koscharis Group of Company. I came from the eastern part of Nigeria. I was born to one late Rose and Peter Maduka. I hail from Newe in Anambra State of Nigeria. So, focusing on the years between 1967 and 1970, Nigeria experienced a civil war in the Biafra, which at the time represented nationalist aspirations of the Igbo people, whose leadership felt they could no longer coexist um, with the northern dominated federal government. Now, growing up in a time like that, how was that for you? What was your experiences? It was a difficult situation. By this time, my father is late and um, it was my mother who were uh, taking care of us. Um, um, I remember that um, uh, the war was close to us that we couldn't farm during the farming season and because we couldn't farm during the farming season there were no food you know during the reaping time most of this this food stuff that are stored get exhausted um, something that is really not funny but we were subjected to a position where we eat everything that has leaf and everything that could move, except human being. Whether you call it lizard, you call it rat, you call it whatever, you just need to eat any movable thing to be able to get protein. Animals that was not for consumption. You just let one person test it. If, he doesn't, if that person don't die and survive, the rest will eat it. Because there were no food, many young children, you know, the disease called kwashioko, you know, get where you have them with big stomach and small head because there's no nutrition food. So the doctors advise us to eat anything leaves. So 
I ate lizard, I ate rat, I ate whatever movable thing. All incense, whether they are flying, you meet them, they are food. And my mother couldn't take it because for her it was unbelievable, but we are kids and it's about survival. In a situation of survival, you, you don't truly understand who you are until you meet a desperate situation and life and death is before you. You could do anything to keep life. And that was how bad it was for us. So many difficulties that you will embark on. Now, how did you manage to overcome all the failures and setbacks in your journey? Um, mindset, again, for me, is very important because um, if you understand that adversity is nothing but a refining fire that burns out the impurities in one's life, you just got to know that uh, it got to get worse before it gets better. That's why in business, we use the language of strategy. Strategy is supposed to be a military language, something that they use in a war. Running a business is like getting into a war. You need to get your strategy right from the one, and then so that if, if it's clear to you where you are going and you meet all of those difficulties, you will always overcome them. I've met quite a number of them, very challenges in, on my way to coming up to the top. Many times I feel like throwing in the towel, but something deep within me said this is not the time to give up and um, we're able to persevere and here we are today. So in light of that, how important would you say entrepreneurs are to the development of Nigeria's economy? I think that's the real thing we need as a nation. Um, of course, um, we can't develop in isolation. We need to take care of corruption, first of all, in our country, because for me, corruption is like a cancer, you know, something that eat up the system in the body, sees all the blood vein, a growth in a human body that has no life of itself. But takes, sees all the blood vein and feed itself. And eventually, when the body died, that growth died in the body as well. When you see corruption, that's what it looks like. But entrepreneurship is what we need in our country, you know. Um, youth entrepreneurship, you know, because a lot of people are looking for jobs today which are not available. But you can create your own business. It's all about service. Entrepreneurship is about offering service, looking for service opportunity and gap where people don't see that opportunity. If you fill in the gap to serve, money will follow you. While others are running after money and money is running away from them. But if you learn to serve, money follows you. And that's what entrepreneurs look for, opportunity to serve and bridge the gap of service you make, you create wealth. Now we've heard so many different accounts of highs and lows in your journey, but the question still stands, what would be your very worst day in business? I've had two worst days in my business life um, that if I live a thousand years, they will all live with me and you can't take it away. One of them was growing up as an entrepreneur, I hadn't been able to organize my business the way I, I am today. And um, some of the boys working for me doing apprenticeship under my uh, supervision, I, we had an office in Anambra State in Inewi. I was in Lagos about to travel to Japan. Suddenly I heard that there's some commotion in my office at Anambra State. I drove down to Anambra State. I just, people were all over the place, about 56 traders. You know, they are looking for my boys, they collected money. I said, why did you pay them? Before you knew it, I was turned to become the first accused. 56 traders sued me under vicarious liability. Um, this was 1979, 1980. It's, it's a moment in my life I will never forget. Some days I have five cases, seven cases in different courts. But like I said, all of these things are training schools. So many things you are in business, you go to Harvard to learn things, but in real life, there are so many things they never taught you in school that you met. Um, it was hard, and this was what led me ultimately to incorporating Kostaris Motu when I parted with uh, my former partner, David Ngosu. 
The second was moment day in my life that I will not forget. You know, it was um, sometime in 2011, sitting in my office and the phone rang. Oh, it's a kid brother from my state. It was an oil business. He wanted me to assist him. I, I, he had some difficulties. You know, I tried to talk with him on the phone, tried to counsel him. You know, a lot of people call me for counseling and mentorship, uh, which I believe is important for business. Um, at the end of the day, he convinced me to come and see what he's doing. Um, I went with my wife to see what he's doing, and I was fascinated looking at how far he has built his business, and he looking for a line. I, I was sitting in two public quoted company, banks. I, one of them um, were owning about 70% uh, equity in one of the banks. And um, I tried to get the banks to support him and they were not willing to support him. So I said, okay, fine. I will guarantee the transaction. You put the credit under my name. And I parted with over $300 million. Um, the first was, we did this systematically. The first one was a vessel load of PPMC. The consignment came within 45 days, the cleanup. The second one, it was good in me. I didn't know that was it. But before December 2011, he came with six documents and said if I did this for him, that this is all that he, I would have done for him in life. We've done several transactions, about six, and they were all successful. At the time late, he paid at the correct period, no issue. And so I did six documents at a time. And um, something I never had in my life in business history, it wasn't cash that I gave him. A letter of credit was open from the bank. And then we had documents waiting for the consignment till today. The consignment never arrived in Nigeria. The guy went abroad, um, connived with the shipping company. You know, he, he nominated the vessel and sold the consignment offshore. And I was left with a liability of over 21 billion naira. Every month, interest is dropping in my account worth $300 million, uh, worth 300 million naira on a monthly basis. So it's like a man who had an accident bleeding. If you don't stop it, you can bleed to death because under prudential guideline, a director of bank cannot get waiver for interest rate. Um, trying to solve this problem, made me because i am truly a committed person if i made a promise to you i will keep it regardless of what it took i sold all my stake in one of the institutions where i am a director and i was having a controlling share to pay off that debt um, um it, it my franchise was threatening because this was not something you planned for and that's why, you know, when we talk about success, you, you don't get to any point and say you have arrived because there are obstacles you meet along the line. An entrepreneur must continue to reinvest into his business and keep reserve capital because there are shocks that you are going to meet that you never anticipated for. That's how life is made, totally. If we are financial fragile, that would have been our end. So life has what I can call um, um, a face, you know, um, different times in your life, you see things goes well, you can call it cycle of life. And I, I, I sat back sometime and I'm able to identify that every seven years of my life, something major like this happened. You know, it's like a, a, a seven year cycle of life. And I, I can trace them back the first four years of my, my birth, my, my father died when I was four. The second seven years of my life, I started working for my uncle before 15. He gave me 200 naira at the age of 14 for my settlement. Another cycle. I had ambitions what to do before I turned 21. I wrote them down. I got married when I was 19 planning all of those things. Before 21, something X happened. I lost part of all my capital. Another seven cycle of my life. The one I told you that happened with my boys was before 28. 
from 27, this was happened when I was 26 years old. So I've been able to identify them. Whenever they are coming close, I am much more sober. And I've seen this happen, met different challenges in life. But each moment you see these challenges, like this is your end, you are never going to survive it. Something happened, if I ever overcome that challenge, I am triple, not triple, just like, I am like catapulted 10 times much bigger than I've always been. And that's truly what life is all about. We never move to any second class in life until we overqualified for the third position where we held. So in light of how damaging or crippling that experience was for you, how did you manage to overcome that difficulty? Because if I hadn't cleaned up that liability and been able to have some reserve to be able to solve that problem, the very franchise cost charities would have been threatening because when you are in a business, when you become insolvent, when you can't pay your obligations and your suppliers are calling you for payment and you cannot, that is the end of you. You are, you are, you are heading to bankruptcy. And it, once you erode confidence, people, you can't meet a commitment on the due date. You are not, you don't want nothing anymore. And that's what it is. It was truly threatening to the organization. But because of the reserve we have built into the company, we were able to underwrite and discount it and move ahead. So this happened in 2003. I pursued the guy by constitutional right that I have only in February 19, 2014. I got Amcon paid 16 billion naira out of that money. I ultimately lost about 9 or 10 billion naira, both on interest rate and then the real money. Now with that steep learning curve, how did that manage to inform all your subsequent business decisions? How did it infect that process? Of course, today you don't take anybody on a first value. Um, um, it, I pride myself that I am very, very careful when it comes to risk taking, but you, you, you find how careful you are. <clears throat> Things are still going to happen that you never anticipate. That's one lesson I learned. The second lesson is that don't ever take a risk you cannot over, you cannot discount. Obviously, that was the case in this matter because if I could not have discounted this risk, because Charis would have been a history. It would just be was, not is anymore. You know that would have been the end. And once you are not in a position to meet up your obligations, bank will tear you apart, you know, and that, that will be the end of it. So um, the lessons are very numerous, uh, um, not to take people on, on their face value, um, and don't be too excited about all the mitigations you put in place to mitigate risk, but weigh risk and be sure risk any risk you are taking a risk you are capable to discount should anything happen. So that must have been a very difficult experience for you. What, were you, what did you learn from it? If I want to put it in my whole life generally, well, there's one thing if I have opportunity to do, I will do all over again. I will do it completely different. I mean, is that I lived for 14 years of my life before I came to meet the person of Jesus Christ in his saving grace. If I have opportunity to redeem that 14 years and be a Christian from the day I was born, that's one thing I would have loved to do. In my business, what if I have opportunity, I would, I would do differently than I have done now. One would have been to set up my business in a, with system and processes from day one, which we never did because of the kind of capital we started the business with. It took us time to mature, to know how to put system and processes in place to run organization. So if I had the opportunity, I would have started it from day one, put proper governance that not to reinvent wheel and learn things along the way, but that is something I would have done all over uh, uh, the reverse way again. With all of your wealth of knowledge that you've acquired, what advice would you give out there to young entrepreneurs that are looking at starting up businesses? My key advice to a young entrepreneur or anybody who truly inspired to be an entrepreneur is to sincerely believe in his or her vision and be willing 
to be misunderstood. You will never be a true entrepreneur if you try to fit into people's opinion about who you are, try to live up to people's expectation, an entrepreneur must be willing to be misunderstood. Believe in yourself and have confidence and set pretty high goals for yourself and drive it with passion. The passion I'm talking about is something that eats you up. It consumes you. You go to bed, wake up sleeping. Something wakes you up in the middle of the night. And that's passion that it eats you up. In the processes of all of this, you have nothing to prove yet to anybody. And people will doubt you and tell you to your face that you are never going to be anybody in life. But you convince them to be patient. If you are well determined and remain focused, there's no goal a man or a woman set for himself that is not attainable if you are focused on it and pursue it with passion. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Cosmas Maduka. It's been absolutely inspiring um, and it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on Forbes Africa TV, My West Day. Thank you, Peace, for having me on your show. It's been a great pleasure sharing these experiences with you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've met the man himself, but let's find out what his colleagues had to say about him. My name is Cosmas Junior Maduka. I'm the executive director of uh, Koshara's group, Special Duties. Kostas Maduka is my boss and also my father. My name is uh, Stella Mokolo. I am the secretary to Dr. Cosmas Maduka. I've worked with him for the past eight years. My name is Joe. I work with Dr. Maduka as his personal assistant. I've worked with him in the last eight years and uh, He's a wonderful person to work with. It depends on the angle you want to view Dr. Marika. He's a, a very thorough person. He pushes us to the world most of the time. A perfectionist. He is a detailed person. He believes in himself. Impossibility is not in his dictionary. Where others fail, that is where Dr. Marika wants to succeed. A hard worker and a visionary. His idea is that you must get it right the first time. He doesn't take no for an answer. You, you don't have the opportunity to tell the, you know, the story. But at the end of the day, what he looks at is at the result you are going to give him. That makes him one kind of person to work with. He's very dedicated to his work and um, to his Christian beliefs and to his family. One thing about him is that the way he started his business 40 years ago is the same way he's working hard up to today. From four when he lost his, um, or five when he lost his, par his father, up until now, it's just been a story of resilience, um, you know, diligence, hard work, dedication, and it's just a typical example of what you dream of you can achieve. And um, we have learned a lot from him. He doesn't mismanage money. He's a very honest person. And he's a true Christian. He will hide his pains, but make people happy. He's such a man. And um, we that we are working with him, we've learned a lot from him. Well, it's not easy. You can, you can imagine being the first son of uh, Dr. Maduka. There's the constant pressure of um, what, what are you gonna bring to the table or what are you gonna add? But um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pressure I like to take on and a, sh uh, you know, a struggle that I face on a daily basis that I'm sure I can uh, handle. Well, there you have it. A day like no other, and like it happened to Cosmos Maduka, it can also happen to any one of us. But it is important to remember the ability of an entrepreneur to succeed lies in his or her persistence to overcome every resistance that they may face and eventually break through again to success. My name is Peace Hyde, and this is Forbes Africa TV.